in the dim streetlight washed darkness, I'm making my way home from another long day of work, already thinking of my comfortable couch and the dinner I'll cook for myself. As I approach my front door, I notice something out of place. There's a package out front, on my doorstep. An even squared box with sharp and clean edges and wrapped in brown paper neatly. The parcel is bound with a length of twine, and as I raise my eyes from it, something catches my attention. I see my name, Alex, and it is written very boldly and in a rather refined script on the front of the package in some sort of shiny black ink that reflects a little of the porch light. It seems strangely elegant for the simple package. I lean in and look for a return address, but don't see anything. The package is blank on both sides, save for the tidy twine that binds it all together. Did I order something? I ask to no one in particular, racking my brain for any recent online shopping. Now really curious, I pick up the package, noting its surprising weight. It feels heavy in my hands as I carry it inside, like it's packed with something more solid than it should. I drop it on the kitchen table and it lands with a muted thud in the quiet house. I very gingerly slip the point of my kitchen knife under the twine, being careful to not mar the box below. There it is, beneath the brown paper. The paper parts easily and I fold back the flaps that enclose it, revealing a beautifully crafted antique-looking hourglass cradled in a bed of crimson velvet. It's a very elegant timepiece, and nothing that I recognize from my limited experience with antiques. I pull it out of the box and set it on the table. It's a very nicely made hourglass, with what I'd guess to be polished mahogany bases and solid tops, and probably a foot high. The wood is a beautiful dark brown color and has a nice patina of sheen that reflects some of the light in the kitchen pleasantly. The edges of the wooden ends are very rounded and somehow both graceful yet robust. The glass is perfect and unmarred, and it is pinched at the waist like some lady's skirts, giving an unobstructed look at the way the sands are here. They are anything but the normal drab beige we are used to. They're a beautiful deep gold, with the smallest flecks of shiny material throughout, glinting in the light, almost looking like little bits of magic. They are also pretty fine grains, and when I turn the glass, they almost move like molten metal, maintaining a smooth and almost mesmerizing flow of golden light. The hourglass's mahogany end caps are intricately carved, for a second only that they are made up of some sort of interlocking pattern of symbols, none of which I recognize. The intricacy of the carving leads me to believe that these caps are the results of many hours, if not days of labor. I don't really think about it as I just tip the hourglass over. The weighty wooden base slaps down upon the tabletop with a muffled sound, and the golden granules begin their slow passage from bulb to bulb. Within seconds, the entire room is unaccountably quiet, like someone just hit the mute button on the world. The refrigerator stops humming, the muted sounds of traffic cease, even the steady tick of the wall clock has suddenly disappeared and the world is replaced with an almost deafening silence that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My heart pounds in my chest as I look out the window, and I have to remind myself to breathe. The birds in the sky outside my window are frozen perfectly still in midair, wings splayed out to their fullest, looking for all the world like some sort of statue someone had taken the time and effort to carve in full flight. I can even make out the individual positions of their feathers, and it's all I can do not to blink and miss some tiny detail of their motions. People are frozen in place all over the street, motionless statues from a museum. A child from a nearby playground stops his motion midway through a jump on a swing, and a couple nearby seem to be frozen in a moment of silent mirth, hands clasped. My eyes flick over to the trees around me, frozen in that same time suspension. The leaves on them all are equally still. Everything is waiting or watching. Each and everything around me seems to be under some sort of scrutiny, every detail being examined under a microscope. The texture of the tree bark, individual petals on the blossoms in our neighbor's garden. Hello? I find myself calling into the silence the uncertainty in my voice causing it to shake. 
For a moment, it's as though the word is somehow alien, and I don't know why I'm saying it or who I'm saying it to, but there is a desperate need for some other voice, any voice, to fill me in response. My words rebound to me, reflecting from the walls around me and filling the unnatural stillness with a ghostly resonance. Every little noise I make, with my clothes or the floorboards I stand on, is somehow amplified, lending to my sense of loneliness and isolation. My heart beats hard in my chest, and I can feel my anxiety growing. Refusing to wait for any other solution, I step forward and grasp the hourglass, carefully reversing its rotation. For an instant, I can feel the tension of that heartbeat pause, of everything held in abeyance. And then, like the way the air moves when a storm passes, the world explodes into motion. Birds that were frozen in flight suddenly leap forward, wings flapping and songs echoing. Leaves rustle and move with the wind. In the far distance, the constant growl of cars and the high-pitched screams of children playing in a nearby yard hit my ears at the same time. I'm left here in the midst of more activity than I ever thought possible, my heart still thudding in my chest, otherwise, but then with a terror that I'm struggling to comprehend. In some manner, I've been to given a taste of what it is like to wield the power that this hourglass has hidden away. To feel the rush of excitement as I was able to experience control over time, even if for only the brief few moments that I managed it. Yet now, I am left with the realization of just how massive that power is, and what sort of dark consequences and unknown aspects it is concealing from me. I have no idea what I'm dealing with, but there are a hundred possibilities spinning through my head at once, and a thousand challenges headed my way. I find that with each passing hour, my mind drifts more and more to the hourglass on my table, and each time I catch that hint of sparkling sand on the edge of my vision, it seems to pique my interest more. By the end of the day, I'm nearly consumed with the need to spin it again. When the quiet settles in, and the night quiets my apartment, I have to satisfy that urge, that need. I take a deep breath and reach out and turn the hourglass over. Suddenly, the world outside is just as quiet, peaceful. I feel a nervousness and excitement as I open my apartment door and step out into the silent world. The streets of the city are silent and motionless, and the cars have all stopped. People stand frozen on street corners and sidewalks, some with joyful faces, others thoughtful or surprised, all caught within the impermanence of the city around them. Everything looks like a world that has paused for a breath, frozen in time. I feel a surge of both power and awe as I watch the frozen scenes around me. The world is laid out before me like a giant canvas, and I am the only conscious painter. I can gently lay my fingertips on the frozen petals of a flower, observe a raindrop frozen in mid-drop, and play with the juggling balls of a street performer. I realize that I can interact with this world and not even hint that I was here. I reach the point where I can imagine that the extent of my actions is restricted only by my own imagination. I can do anything, mischievous things, helpful things, things of exploration. But then it's over and I realize that I'm lonely at heart. I'm feeling the weight of being the only thing moving around here. I decide I'm done for now and make my way back to the apartment. When I get back to my door, I reach out and very carefully rotate the hourglass back the way it was. I can start to hear the sounds of distant car horns and voices, the general hum of the city, and know that it is just something I'll need to get used to. Still, as I sit on my couch, I can't shake the unease. My understanding of the world and my place within it has changed. I've been exposed to something beyond my reckoning, given to me as a gift by some unknown benefactor. I know the promises of the hourglass are real, but I can also feel deep inside me that it's not some toy. This is all new to me, and I don't know what comes next, but I feel a bit of both eagerness and trepidation at the possibilities the future holds. The way that the hourglass gifts me with power feels like some secret weapon. Just by activating it, I have control over time. It's exhilarating in a way. Things that seemed impossible before now feel like trifles. The thing is, 
During the day, when things are moving so fast and I have so many tasks to do, I'm feeling the pressure to produce better results for my boss, to provide the necessary information for my team, trying to figure out how to get through my ever-increasing stack of assignments. That's when it's important, when I can see the walls getting closer and hear the clock counting my frustration to have that hourglass. Until one day, when I'm stressed almost to the breaking point, my brain is spinning from the flashing urgent needs in my email inbox, and my phone is going nuts with client calls, and I just can't take it. I get up from my desk and walk to the break room, and after locking the door behind me, I look around quickly and pull the hourglass from my bag. When I throw the switch, the room changes shockingly. It had been filled with the sounds of voices beyond the walls, the beeping of the microwave as it boiled a cup of leaden coffee, and the smell of that coffee. But now it's quiet. Everything in here stops, the coffee pot steaming, the fluorescent lights above, even the dust motes in the air. It's so quiet, and it surrounds me like a warm blanket. It's very rare that the world is so perfectly silent that the ambient noise of the station is almost inaudible. The dimmed stillness allows my stresses and anxieties to momentarily drift away without any effort or thought. I walk over to one of the couches and appreciate the full volume of the padding of the cushions as I sit heavily and slump backward. These things are always so damned comfortable. I lay back, on some level of my subconscious mind, recognizing that no one will enter this room, that I won't be disturbed, that nothing in this building needs my immediate attention, and that there are no alerts or calls incoming that will disturb me. That thought of just laying on the couch and taking a nap, however uncomplicated it is, however I know nothing will disturb me, and no alarms will sound, and I have a nap and just... drift. Asleep. I close my eyes and just drift off. Sometimes I like to play tricks. One morning, with everyone in the office buzzing around and busy with their work and sipping at their coffee, I snuck in and turned the hourglass over and froze the office in that instant of time. I grin and continue my tampering. Ms. Carter gets Mr. Thompson's latte, and Ethan gets his papers shuffled out of order. He's so meticulous about his paperwork. This is going to drive him nuts. In the hallway, I see two interns chatting away loudly, and they've placed their shoes next to each other. Smirking, I knot their shoelaces together. After I've set my pranks, I return the hourglass to its starting point, and life suddenly returns to normal speed. In short order, the office is voicing surprise and confusion. Ms. Carter is scowling at her coffee, wondering why it tastes off, and Mr. Thompson is staring intently at the cup in front of him. Ethan is looking at all the things on his desk in bewilderment. As predicted, the two interns fall over each other at the same time to chorus laughter from those observing. Throughout all this chaos I've instigated, I continue to appear completely distracted, all the while hiding the grin that wants to split my face. That said, the hourglass isn't just for playing games. It's also incredibly useful when I'm trying to perform better in important meetings, where every minute counts and people are looking for quick answers and smart thinking. When things start to get heated and ideas are flying, I can just bring the room to a standstill, allowing me time to really think about what's been said, how things are shaking out, or even to look something up on my phone. Then, when I start time back up, it sounds like I've already got my answer ready to go, and everyone nods along and looks appropriately impressed. They talk about what a quick thinker I must be to always have the right answer so fast. They have no idea what my little hourglass is hiding. It's the end of another long day, and I'm just taking a leisurely walk through the park before heading home for the night, enjoying the peacefulness of the darkness. And for some reason, I just decide that I'd like to keep this moment, to make this my own little park. Without any more conscious thought, I turn the hourglass over, and the soft sounds of crickets, the people laughing in the near distance, and the rustling of leaves is suddenly muted. The park is my favorite place to be, a vast expanse of green grass and tall trees and web-like paths that wind their way here and there. It's somewhat quiet compared to the city streets, and it is less jarring to the senses. Sometimes, like tonight, 
I like to walk along the path in my uniform, under the starlit sky and the golden lamplight overhead. Even with the all the serrated darkness of the shadows and the sounds of the night, the world is still achingly beautiful, and a calming dreariness threat that just out of sight drapes around my shoulders. Something so similar to peacefulness, the tranquility and just a bit of loneliness that comes from the forced separation from the rest of society. I, in this place, the city sounds are muted into an undertone, but that doesn't mean that it's completely silent. Perhaps a bit surreal, like a dream, one of this moment's frozen in motion in the glass of some cosmic hourglass. But it's anything but peaceful, and as I come to the center fountain, I notice movement. Something. Something that can't be right. But I rub my eyes. I must be more tired than I thought, because it was nothing. But when I look again, my pulse quickens. And there, past the fountains and between the trees, are more vague shapes moving, yet not moving. They're shapes, sort of, but moving or shifting like light distorted on rippling water. It's hard to describe, and the only thing that I can be certain of is that they're unsettling to view, finding no real faces or features that make any sense, like they're made of shadows somehow. A chill wind gusts suddenly from nowhere, incongruous in this frozen world, and setting the leaves swirling defensively all around me, and the unease grows heavier in my chest. I step closer, racking my brain for some rational explanation, some way to expose the illusion or truth behind the figures, but I can never get a clear view of them. Deciding that I need to stop thinking of them, that it was just my active imagination, I pick up the pace towards my apartment, feeling their gaze following me with each step. I know they're tracking me somehow, even as I start to see buildings of the city and hope for some measure of relief within the safety of my home. I nearly break into a full-on sprint as I reach the front entrance of my apartment building. Just inside, I quickly flip the hourglass. The familiar sounds of the city return, but I find little solace in them. I am uncomfortably aware that, in this world of quiet isolation, I am not alone. There is something else here with me in the shadows, watching me. Now, when I use the hourglass, there's an anxious edge to it, almost a tickling at the back of my mind, just out of reach. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I know that when I use the hourglass again, the darknesses come that much closer. Those distant faded shapes are closer now, darker and less indistinct, moving closer to me with each use. I don't really know what it was that made me do it. Sometime during the middle of the day, in the middle of a long and arduous meeting, I just pause time for the hell of it. But when I look out the window of the conference room, where I'd expected to see the towering skyline of the city before it, and jutting to within a few feet of the window, blocking my view was the vague, shadowy form of several figures standing silently just outside. It was something I'd become accustomed to since that day in the field with the fairy, and it was no less unsettling now, towering skyscrapers making me feel protected by their flanks. The city as a whole, which once seemed so open, now feels closed in, I find myself looking for shadows that may present hiding places, even in the streets I walk through. Dark shapes could be watching on my from any of a hundred places. Coffee shops, parks, walking in the grocery store. No place feels free of them. The air feels oppressive, weighted with the anticipation of them. I'm feeling okay about it in here in my apartment one night. It's all warmly lit, and I'm sitting in my favorite armchair with a book, just after I'd turned over the hourglass, when I thought it'd be nice to keep the hourglass up and running a little bit longer, and everything is quiet and still and so very wonderful for a little bit, until I see them. They're right outside my window now, closer than ever. I can see them plainly, and they look like nothing more than just man-shaped silhouettes, except they are all black, pitch black, and are featureless. It's almost like they're made of darkness, and I can feel an overwhelming sense of evil will pouring from them. My heart is hammering in my chest, and it's all I can do not to scream. Out of desperation, I lunge towards the hourglass, and as I flip it back over, restart time, and the menacing figures begin to dissipate, 
dissipate back into the tapestry of the night. But I have lost the safety of my home, the protection offered by the barriers I have managed to maintain for as long as I can remember. I know it cannot possibly be, but in my heart, I fear that I may not be able to avoid the darkness of the looming dread forever. The hourglass is upon the table, glistening with its flowing sands, beautiful in its ornate construction. There is something almost energetic about it, something that makes me think it needs to be used again. It is beautiful, but something about it is darker than it should be. It is like an old world piece with a darkness attached to it. Some malevolent force that has been waiting here behind this antique, in front of this thing innocently displayed. I move my hand over its unmarred form, thinking back to the amazement I'd felt when I first saw it. It offered a life without limitation, where time could be shaped according to desire. But now, these very limitations seemed intent on deceiving me. Times when everything was quiet and still may not be safe at all, but opportunities for something else to sneak up behind me. The hourglass, its possibilities, both for playfulness and mischief, for benefit or harm, are undeniable. There's something seductive about it, something enticing, yet something threatening, something dangerous. I remember the laughter, the happiness, the peace it brought in a world that was anything but. But now I can't help but think of the silent watchers that were always there. The air in the room grows cooler, and I feel the presence of the hourglass weighing heavily on me. I find my hands clasping together, and a chill of apprehension inches up my spine. The struggle between wanting it and being frightened of it grows more intense. I find myself torn between desiring the power it promises and the danger that I know must lay just behind the edge of my vision. I take a long breath and sit back in my chair, eyes still fixed on the hourglass. What in the hell am I doing? I utter aloud. I can't remember ever straddling the line between gift and burden so closely as this. As the night grows later, I struggle with the choice I'm facing. One way or another, I know that either decision is going to alter the course of my life permanently. Day turns to night, and it fills the room with heavy, stifling air. I used to get a charge out of it more, but now it just makes me feel uncomfortable, like some sort of anchor that drags at me and weighs me down. At night, I can't sleep. I lay there, as still and relaxed as I can manage, as if I'm in that plastic and metal prison of an airport bed all over again. But every noise, any creak of the floorboards or sound outside, makes my heart leap excruciatingly in my chest. I instinctively draw the covers up a little higher, trying to keep away the chill that is inexorably crawling over my body, despite the heat and humidity prevalent in this backwater cabin. At night, when everything is quiet, sometimes I think I can hear whispering. Like a wordless, muted conversation from nowhere. I tell myself it's just the wind or something else external like the sounds of the city, but I can't shake the feeling that it's related to the hourglass and the shadows. Sometimes, I have this feeling like any moment, I'll look up from washing my face or kicking on the kettle for tea, and there will be a couple of them in the bathroom reflection or the window to the bedroom hallway. I feel like I'll find one in the draft of the dark hallway when I'm walking back from the bathroom to the other rooms. So far, though, they've never been there, but you can't shake the fear that they're waiting for you. Like I said, that could be just as bad. I find myself feeling trapped in my home now, like any of these windows could suddenly have the silhouette of something staring back at me from the other side of the glass, and the walls have suddenly closed in around me, and the ceilings dropped leaving every room a little more oppressive than they were just the day before. Just the simple act of turning off a light feels like an act of courage. I've tried to contain it, moving the hourglass to different places, locking it away in a drawer, hiding it in a closet, wrapping it in more layers of cloth and concealing it again. But still, with whatever measures I take, the darkness creeps out and the shadows hang around. Even my friends and family have seen the change in me, in my mood. That happy-go-lucky guy they knew is now a jittery mess, but when they ask if I'm okay, I just smile and assure them that I am. I can't very well tell them the truth anyway, 
Who could believe such a thing? The hourglass, so lovely and ornate, intricate in its craftsmanship, yet a wolf in sheep's clothing. It is all I can think about. How do I get away from it? From them? That night I was making dinner and knocked the pot of boiling water over on the counter, and out of reflex, tipped the hourglass over, holding the frozen water-frozen cascade in midair, set right just in time to suddenly feel it again, to be aware of them again, the shadows moving in closer, almost into arm's reach but still formless in their details, and nearly shit myself with fear at their silent approach. I quickly flip the hourglass, and the water pours out onto the stove, and the figures vanish. But the dread feeling stays. I can't do this anymore. I say aloud. I shut the hell up the hot plate with shaking hands, and slid the pot away from the flame. More of that steam rose, hissing like a snake, like there, uh, with it, and I had to calm my breath it was so loud in my ears. The room seemed to be getting smaller, the walls coming in, as if they were pressing in on me. I move away from the stove, watching the hourglass that sits on the counter, and watching the sand fall, seeming just a bit too slow, but somehow very unhappy with the rate at which I am able to avert my gaze from it with each turn. The heat of the steam water is already beginning to turn to steam, a thin misting fog rising into the air around the top of the stove and adding to my unease. I drop into a chair at the kitchen table, my head swimming with the thoughts. It seems that every time I use the hourglass, it draws them to me, draws them in closer and makes them more real. What do they want? Why do they come for me? Is it the hourglass they seek, or is there something deeper, something about me? Sitting here like this, thinking, listening to the sounds of the city outside, traffic honking, the sounds of children at play, and people talking somewhere distantly. I find that they are good to me, making me feel conscious and grounded where before I thought nothing of them. Still, as much as I appreciate these noises, there's another thought creeping in. How long before those things pass through the zone of stopped time and appear here in the real world, in front of me? not just as silhouettes. How long before they're actually punching mice? I spring to my feet then, with a new resolve. I can't keep living in fear, always watching behind me, worrying every time that I want to reach for the hourglass. I need to find some answers, some way to fight or understand these things. The following day, I head over to the town library. Maybe someone else has found that hourglass and knows about those shadowy things. I need information about ancient artifacts, especially hourglasses. Can you point me to those sections? I ask the librarian. She raises an eyebrow curiously. There are many stories of time and relics and artifacts. Not so many about hourglasses, surprisingly. But she's lying to me, because this section is all full of old myths and fables, and she's pulling out an old dusty book. Relics of Eternity, she says and she's rifling through the pages, and she points to a paragraph that talks about some sort of timekeeping artifact, but the description doesn't match the hourglass I'm holding. Thanks. I appreciate your time, I say quietly, with disappointment. The setting sun is throwing long shadows as I exit the library, and it's making me a bit jumpy. Everything dark corner and flicker of shadow seems menacing at the moment. Hell, I can't seem to shake the feeling that I'm being watched. One night, when I'm in my apartment and feeling the pressure of that next looming deadline, I find myself reaching for the hourglass. Just this once, I tell myself, knowing how it could add additional hours to my night. As soon as I turn it, the temperature drops in the room and I see the dark shapes moving closer, almost where I could reach out and touch them in their billowing ephemeral forms. No! I cry, desperation in my voice, and I quickly turn the hourglass again, banishing them, but leaving the room feeling cold and the acrid sensation of their presence still there, like a dark stain. I can't sleep. I lay there in bed, tossing and turning, staring at the hourglass from its place on the nightstand and wondering when they'll arrive here. When they'll find me, using that damn thing as their homing beacon. My mouth dries with fear. Why are they coming? 
I say it out loud, the question echoing in my apartment, in the stillness of the early morning. I'm no closer to an answer. The days blur together in a haze of paranoia and fright. I start at shadows and fear away from poorly lit areas. The hourglass feels less like a blessing and more like a curse now, and I feel the presence of the entities around me continually, just watching, waiting, and growing closer by the moment. Everything seemed so quiet and threatening with the hourglass right there. I almost felt like some of those figures might be hiding in the corners or darknesses of my house. The heavy feeling of dread that the hourglass was somehow chaining me to something implacable. I think about it for a long time and then get the few things I need. A wooden crate, a shovel, and a flashlight. I need somewhere remote and very wooded, far from the house. I drive out to the spot, and my hands ache with the need for a tighter grip on the steering wheel. Each pothole turn and breeze-rustled leaf set my teeth on edge, and I repeated to myself, this has to work. As soon as I arrive, I head out into the forest as deep as I can and make sure that I'm not near any trail or anything else that seems familiar. I keep the world around me a blurry thing, making sure I just keep lifting one foot up and putting it in front of the other. With each footfall, walking hourglass, I feel the weight of it more keenly and the strength of the magic begins to pull at my being. It's only hours later of what such a spot lies behind a great boulder and amidst short scrub and thickets, the ground difficult and every shovelful of dirt I dislodge from it a growing victory. My arms are aching and my face is shiny with sweat, but I'm determined to keep the shovel moving. I crouch low to reach far enough into the hole that when I find my desperate task momentarily blocking shovel in hand, blade a foot deep, and when I can barely reach it. The hole is deep enough now for me to be able to replace the hourglass in the world, and more importantly, myself. I laid the hourglass carefully into the box and closed it, passing it down, and felt a sudden flood of relief, of fear, of hope all at once as I lowered it into the hole. As I covered it with dirt, I did my best to inter it alongside the memories, the shadows, and the fear. At least, the way it's done. The hourglass is buried now. I find myself standing for a moment, drawing a long breath of the cool forest air and listening to the sounds of the birds and rustling leaves around me. One more glance at the grave behind me, and I turn and begin walking away putting a bit of hope into the fact that I'm far enough away from that hourglass to have broken the relationship between myself and those horrific things. I will never really know if I got away. And the days go by, and it starts feeling like normal life again. I don't dread the workday, and I don't find myself constantly worried about my every interaction with my colleagues and bosses, afraid that something or someone is watching. I can talk and laugh with my co-workers without feeling unnatural or forced. Interactions with other people don't feel scripted, and even simple things like going to the store or reading a book feel somewhat joyous in comparison. I don't know, it's hard to explain. Like everything is just a little bit more real or alive. I find myself growing to appreciate the smaller things more. The warmth of the morning cup of freshly brewed coffee the chill in the air of the early morning, and the simple pleasure in a long, leisurely walk through the park. I start to rebuild the habits that were disrupted by the hourglass. Exercise, hobbies, and catching up on my missed television shows find their way back into my routine, and my friends and family notice the difference too. They no longer notice the withdrawn and preoccupied me, and I'm much more engaged. Still, there are days when I find myself thinking about that day and how an hourglass showed up on my doorstep. I used to ask myself from time to time, why me and where did it originate? But that was about it. It was just thoughts, like the brief waves that gently distort the surface of a pond. But I guess peace is short-lived. At some point that night, I'm roused from a restless sleep and am suddenly acutely uncomfortably aware of the weight of the hourglass. Nearly shit myself right then. I don't know why it needed to wake me to that sensation, but I knew it was two in the morning, and I thought to look to my nightstand. And it was there. That hourglass was there, and I swear my heart was going to beat right out of my chest. 
I can't edit the writing. I see them out of the corner of my eye, and my head turns minutely, halting as they come into view. The outside of the window here is blocked by the silhouettes of the figures, closer than they have ever been before, almost touching the glass with their dark forms. I can almost reach out and touch them from here, that is how close they are. I shiver. The hourglass is pressed tightly to my chest, and I can feel its icy surface against my hands and arms. There's nowhere to run, no way to bury it, no possibility of fleeing from whatever darkness it is that it seems to attract. They're drawn to it somehow, to me. I can feel the walls of the room closing in on me as I realize that I can't get away from the hourglass or the figures. With a sudden burst of courage, I decide that I need to put a stop to this, come what may. I can't keep running from it, can't keep being afraid to live this way. The chill in the room grows, and I feel the darkness reach out to all the corners, using the hourglass to stop time again. The dark shapes move closer, but do not slow. I can feel them distorting something primal in the fabric of time and space, and every instinct is screaming at me to run, to find a way out, but there is no way out. I'm trapped here, frozen in this moment, bound by choices I've made. I force myself to find my voice, and it shakes with defiance and desperation. What do you want? I scream at them. But still they do not respond, only continue their steady and implacable approach. The line between the world that I am familiar with and the one that I am facing is growing more and more indistinct. Please, I plead, my voice shaking and loud in the quiet. I never realized. I didn't want any of this. But my words fade away in the frozen air, lost within the unending blackness. They do not stop and do not heed my command. I try to rationalize and plead, growing desperate. I will never use it again, I swear. Just take it and go. I hold the hourglass out toward them. But they don't listen, and they don't care. They're like natural forces, bound by rules older than mankind and set in motion millennia before. From fear, it becomes despair, and I find myself shivering with the overwhelming sense of impending doom. Everything is black and shadowed now, and I see dark figures approaching me. My thoughts are a blur, and I can't focus on anything past moments of my childhood, of my family and friends, good times and happy memories, all dissolving into the encroaching shadows. I shout, guttural, primal, as that instinct rages in the face of my annihilation. No! I yell, lifting the hourglass high over my head, determined that I will not die without one last defiant effort. I can feel their anticipation, their hunger. The world around me seems to stretch and warp, as if the fabric of reality itself were starting to unravel. No more! I scream, tears flowing freely as I collapse to my knees, driven by a furious and desperate need. With all that is within me, I hurl the hourglass down upon the unforgiving floor. The silence that follows is almost overpowering. Suddenly time seems to leap violently back into motion again, and the remnants of the shattered hourglass are scattered across the desk, bits of glass and sand cascading out upon the flagstone floor at my feet. But it's not the end. They surround me and enfold me in darkness and frigid blackness, and it's like I'm being torn apart. Like they're dissecting me on a molecular level, on an atomic level. I want to scream, but there's no sound. I can't hear anything other than the void. It hurts more than I can even imagine. More agony than one could suffer in an entire eternity packed into a single moment. But then, it is over. Everything stops. I know that I am floating in a void. A space without light, without sound, without sensation, an emptiness, a non-existence, a place where time is only an illusion. Slowly, the world around me comes back into focus, but I'm still not really a part of it. I'm sitting in the background, watching the normal flow of things start up again. The sun rises, and people go about their business, unknowing of the way things were fought in the darkness earlier. I'm gone, erased. The only thing that remains to show that I ever was at all is the broken hourglass laying on the ground. 